The, the work I presented at this conference is part of a broader uh, research remit. Um, and uh, at some point I'd quite like to acknowledge that this, is, this work is only possible because of quite intrepid patients and families, because of a large group of team of people, but also because we're funded by um, a number of charities, Wellcome Trust, MRC, Alzheimer's Society and Alzheimer's Research UK. And I, I mean, that we are utterly reliant on the support we get from those people to do this work. But this is now work that's been um, conducted over um, about the past 10 years. And so we do feel that we're actually making some of the running in terms of understanding, particularly using complex sound as a tool to, to, to probe what happens in the brain in different dementia diseases, Alzheimer's and other diseases. And music is really only one relatively small part of that actually. So some of the work that we've done over the, over the years, so for example, we've done quite a lot of work showing that people with Alzheimer's disease have really quite striking and sometimes quite early difficulty in understanding more complex scenes in sound. So for example, the classic example of this is the cocktail party, and there's even something called the cocktail party effect, which most of us have experienced where you're in a busy gathering party, someone speaks your name across the room, your brain can focus on that, that, that event and then track what they're talking about um, against all the background noise. So that's an incredibly complicated computational task Patients with Alzheimer's often have particular difficulty with that sort of environment. So we've actually produced evidence both in terms of neuropsychology testing and also shown associated changes in the brain to actually show that this process of cocktail party um, processing actually goes right to the heart of where the damage is in terms of the brain network that's targeted in Alzheimer's disease. It's almost as good, if not a better, indicator of damage to that network than conventional memory tests which is really quite, I think, in some ways a surprising result. The other sort of end of the spectrum, we've looked at really quite high level emotional and social responses to music. And in other non-Alzheimer dimensions, we've shown that patients can lose understanding of sounds, including musical melodies, but they can also um, really have very abnormal emotional responses to sound. So for example, we have a number of patients with frontotemporal dementia who have abnormal craving for music to the point where it actually becomes an intrusive feature in their care and a difficult thing in their daily lives, you know, wanting to listen to the music, sometimes the same music, many, many hours a day, sort of at the top of the stereo volume and quite intrusively. Or um, at the same time, those patients may become very averse to particular sorts of sounds and that can cause a trouble, a trouble for their carers in terms of how they manage that. You know, they may, for example, decide that well, they may find that the, the, the timbre of their grandchildren's voices is suddenly intensely unpleasant. And of course, this causes a lot of distress within the family. And this is really an abnormal emotional response to sound. And so we've done quite a lot of work, both looking at how people process sound at a behavioral level, but also what goes on in the autonomic nervous system. So for example, by recording pupillary responses to sounds uh, and other types of autonomic, automatic responses to sounds, we can actually look at how some of these brain diseases change physiology, so we can actually use sound as a probe to look at those very, very fundamental physiological processes as well. Um, and really, I think um, some of the kind of the, the more forward-looking um, work will be to kind of join up sound with other sensory modalities. And at the moment, we're kind of looking at quite parallel programs of work in things like vision and chemosensory processing, so the understanding of odors and tastes and flavors and sounds, but it would be very important, I think, because in the real world, those things are often conjoined to start to do some experiments which actually look at what people do with dementia diseases when they're having to make sense of really complex mixtures of senses. And the other kind of future direction I, I can see us pursuing is much more in the direction of social cognition and understanding wh what some of these responses to sounds like music and other types of sounds can tell us about people's um, emotional and social responses even their interactions with other people. We're almost using sounds as a model system to try and understand that. So for example, we've got some uh, information from people with frontotemporal dementia to suggest that unlike healthy people of the same age, they can't infer kind of emotional um, stories from listening to music, the same way that many of us would listen to music and sort of take for granted that that's telling us something about an emotion or about a, a kind of a narrative. They, they, they lose the ability to do that. Um, and that, I think, is potentially a very useful model system for understanding a much wider range of problems that these people have when they deal with other, other people, um, including you know, their family members and their, their and close friends. So I think 
you know, I, we found that sound music, but also other types of sounds, is really a very versatile um, sort of system for probing the sorts of processes that link brain damage and brain network changes of dementia to sometimes really quite complex clinical symptoms that people have in their daily lives.